In his new book, Framing the Debate, Jeffrey Feldman reviews 15 presidential speeches from George Washington to George W. Bush and explains how progressive politicians can learn from them. This talk from Cody's Books in Berkeley, California is an hour 20 minutes. Thank you. It's, it's always wonderful to be at Cody's. Um, Jeff Feldman uh, has been uh, one of the mainstays uh, of the Daily Coast for a while and also the Huffington Post uh, and the Tom Hartman Show. Uh, he's one of the people who has picked up on uh, the fact that the right wing has framed most issues uh, very successfully over the past uh, 35 or so years and that progressives have to catch up with this. Uh, I've been working on this for about 10 years and uh, Jeff got into it several years ago and he's one of the best people working in this area. Uh, Framing the Debate is the latest book. I want to say a few things about uh, what framing is about, where it comes, where this idea comes from, and uh, how it differs from spin, which it isn't. Uh, framing is um, what everybody does when they think basically, and when they talk. Uh, frames are conceptual structures that we use for thinking and understanding our everyday lives. We have a uh, conceptual structure, a frame for the word chair. Uh, a chair has uh, a seat, something that holds you up, usually a back, sometimes arms, and that's about it. Simple frame for a chair. Uh, it's framing is the most normal, everyday thing you could possibly do and every word is defined with respect to some frames and metaphors and so on. Moreover, one of the other thing we learn from cognitive science is that most thought is unconscious. About only 2% of thought is conscious. Most of it is below the level of consciousness. It's what your bra brain is doing while you don't know it's doing it. And um, what that means is that when you hear language, which goes by very, very fast, it's activating frames unconsciously in your mind. And this is something that conservatives have been able to take advantage of very well. Uh, and when you hear a frame over and over, it's activated over and over, it becomes part of your brain. It physically becomes part of you. And so what has happened over the past 35 years is that uh, the conservative message machine has been changing brains out there. Is this illegitimate? Sometimes, sometimes not. It depends, depends on whether they're saying what they believe or telling the truth. Sometimes they do, sometimes they lie, sometimes they deceive. But framing, and that's what spin is about. Spin is about the use of framing to deceive, uh, to avoid embarrassment, for example. But real framing, honest framing has to do with saying what you believe, with getting your values across. And framing has everything to do with telling the truth. Uh, there's a, an idea that many uh, progressives have that all you have to do is tell people the facts and they'll reason to the right conclusion. And it's utterly false because facts by themselves mean nothing unless you frame them to give them significance. And that doesn't mean changing their significance, it means communicating their significance. If you're going to tell the truth, you have to frame it. You can't avoid it. If you just tell people, you know, here's some fact, it'll go in one ear and out the other, most likely. So if you want to communicate factual information, if you want to be honest, if you want to say what you believe, that's important. You must frame it. Moreover, all your values are structured in terms of framing. So that if you're going to get across what you value, and values are behind every policy, no policy or program is set up unless people think they're right. And if they're not right, well, what does right mean? It means they accord with your values. So that framing in terms of values is extremely important. You want to get the, your values out there, and that's something that the conservatives have done very, very well. So. What I've been involved with, what the Rock Ridge Institute, for example, has been involved with as an institute, and what Jeff Feldman has been involved with, is the use of honest, effective framing. Framing that not only gets your values across, that only, not only tells you the truth, 
but that gets you emotionally involved in the real reasons why those values are important and why those truths are significant. Uh, what Jeff has done in this book, in Framing the Debate, is look at great speeches that our presidents and other great leaders have done over the past couple of hundred years of, of this republic and asked how did they do it? How did they frame effectively? How did they get their values, their ideas, and their truths across so that people would not only understand it but feel why they were urgent truths? That's what this book is about and here is Jeff Feldman. Thank you so much. Thank you, George, for that wonderful introduction. Um, uh, and thanks to Cody for having me out this evening. Um, and before I get started, let me just tell a, a brief anecdote. I came here um, out to uh, the Bay Area from Portland, Oregon, the last stop on my book tour. And uh, before I did an event um, at a local chapter of a progressive group, I watched uh, the GOP, what I call the GOP puppet show on TV. I don't know how many people saw that, but they build as a debate where they put all their candidates up on the stage. Um, and asked them you know, a series of short questions. And you know, after watching that event, and I have to say, I'm, I'm someone who writes about framing and blogging, uh, very much involved in uh, uh, trying to push this, the great successes that the Democrats had in 2006 election. But after watching that GOP puppet show, I thought, my goodness, we are in trouble. Uh, the GOP did an absolutely fantastic job at framing that event. You came away from watching uh, those candidates, and you had a sense of deep history uh, that that entire field was connected to. From start to finish, that entire event was framed in terms of the legacy of Ronald Reagan. Right from the initial shot that they set up uh, with the cameras, they had uh, special staged events where all the candidates walked through uh, various sections of the library. Ronald Reagan was mentioned, I can't remember how many times I stopped counting. Um, it would have made a great kind of college drinking game to have it there, but um, he was mentioned literally dozens and dozens of times. Um, and in that sense, the elephant in the room that was never mentioned uh, in that particular event was, of course, the current president and current leader of the Republican Party. But by the time you finish listening and watching uh, this event, and there are a couple of their candidates who are not just good eye candy, but uh, they're actually very articulate. By the time you were done, you were asking yourselves, even me, I was asking myself in my hotel room in Portland, my goodness, I'm really excited to find out who's going to be you know, who's going to carry on the torch that Ronald Reagan has passed down to us. It's so exciting. Uh, Ronald Reagan's done such a, such a great job, and here we're just carrying on his legacy. Um, and I mention this because there you had an event. If you remember, going back to the Democratic candidate puppet show, which happened uh, you know, a couple weeks before, um, they began with no common thread, no sense of implotment, no real clear idea of where we should all begin our understanding of what this field is about. We were not asked to imagine what these candidates were inheriting from other Democratic presidents or candidates that had come before them. We were not put in any particular historic location. We were not guided to a common set of questions. Our candidates were simply peppered with gotcha questions about embarrassing gaffes that they had had uh, since they had declared their candidacies or since they had been on television. What an incredibly stark contrast. We have an amazing field of candidates out there, uh, the Democrats, incredibly talented, gifted at rhetoric, and yet here the Republicans had made a decision well in advance of their event that this is where the election would begin. This was not going to be ele an election about George W. Bush and his policies, but it was going to be an election about the Ronald Reagan legacy in America versus um, what liberals would bring to that table. And we all know the refrain uh, that comes in uh, on the heels of that particular way of framing the discussion. Uh, what they, they hammer uh, the Democrats with, big government, uh, irresponsibility, tax and spend, weak on defense. We can repeat it almost in our sleep because uh, we've been hammered so much uh, with these ideas. Um, by way of introduction, um, thinking about events in those terms is what I have been trying to do uh, for the past couple of years. Um, just a word about me. I, um, I'm a cultural anthropologist by training. I hold a, a PhD um, uh, in cultural anthropology. Um, I'm a college professor. And um, about 
three years ago, I started writing on a large group website called The Daily Coast, and I'm sure there's a couple people here uh, who are either um, readers or um, uh, absolutely obsessive writers on The Daily Coast, as we tend to be. Um, but the reason I started writing on The Daily Coast was very specific. Uh, I was watching the last presidential election unfold, and in particular, I had an experience which I imagine many of you had as well. It was watching our candidate, the Democratic candidate, uh, in the debate against the opposition. Now, in theory, in theory, we had a very articulate uh, and smart candidate, and I think, I believe that we did. Uh, you know, John Kerry was uh, and is uh, incredibly bright uh, and very well spoken. Um, and in that debate, not only did our candidate provide answers uh, that were compelling, that were rich with policy detail, not only uh, did he seem to hold the entire discussion better with a level of facts and information um, that was admirable. I mean, most, most college students would have been in awe at the amount of detail he was able uh, to put out there. But the opposition candidate, not only did he stumble, not only did he have long pregnant pauses, but he was actually caught with some type of electronic device embedded between his shoulder blades, uh, which a lot of people believed had something to do uh, with a wireless device <laughs> designed to feed information, feed answers into him. The notion that their candidate, uh, not only not very well spoken, uh, but caught cheating, uh, it seems, uh, in, in, in the debate. And yet, that debate, despite what happened, um, despite the performance by the Democratic candidate, did not seem to have a significant impact in the polling numbers. And I watched that, and I'm sure all of you watched that as well. And I have to say, my sense of what political debate and discussion was supposed to be about really fell apart uh, at, at the end of, the, of that experience. I really really believed that if we prepared, we had all the right information, we had all the right facts, uh, then we would hold the day because the, the, the general electorate, uh, and, and in terms of both a broad scale discussion and also on one to one, you win the discussion when you have the better answer. This is what uh, I had been led to believe, like so many people, for a long time. But at that moment, I realized, I sensed uh, deep down that something uh, was amiss with my understanding. And it was in that environment um, that, uh, that, that George Lakoff put out a, a shorter version uh, of his book, Moral Politics, the book Don't Think of an Elephant, in which um, were articulated, uh, I think, for the first time in a very uh, a clear way for a public audience, um, an alternative way of understanding debate which had to do with the notion of framing rather than the idea of bouncing facts. And it was in, the in that in particular environment that I began a discussion uh, on a, the, a large blog on the Daily Coast about uh, that book. It was a five-part series um, which, uh, which I put out over a series of, uh, of a couple of weeks and which literally just discussed the basic principles of framing, the idea that in order to control political debate, in order to be successful in the way that we believe we should be um, because our ideas are not only the right ideas, but they're actually better ideas for the future of the country, uh, for individuals, for communities, for cities, uh, better ideas on national defense, on environment, on health care, everything. Um, we need to think in terms of the broad ideas that define the rules for the discussion, uh, the big conceptual frames, and those are not uh, things that are put in place simply by lining up facts or policies, uh, but those are put in place uh, by thinking about exactly how we want to couch our ideas in both principles and values, generating language which is effective and persuasive, and then breaking that down in such a way that it can circulate in the current media environment, an environment where politics and media go hand in hand. Um, and so. That's really where I get started um, on, uh, with the book Framing the Debate. I mean, from that point forward, uh, from 2004 forward, I spent uh, most of my waking hours um, trying to do my best uh, to frame issues as they came up in the media. Um, my average day, um, going back to that moment, you know, like a lot of bloggers, I wake up uh, before I have coffee and I go to the White House website, which uh, I'm sure, uh, while we have an incompetent, relatively incompetent president, um, they keep an absolutely fantastic website. Um, every single word that comes out of uh, the president's mouth is put up on the website um, almost instantaneously and without typos, I should add. Um, although I did find one once 
um, and also for Vice President Cheney, uh, they include that. And so I go to the White House website, and I read every word that they put out every day, um, which is an interesting experience to do over a number of years. I recommend it before breakfast, not after. Um, but I read it, and I look for the telltale signs of good framing. I look for words that are being repeated. I look for big metaphors that are being floated out into the debate, which are also being picked up um, by the news media. Um, I mean, this is how the Republicans frame uh, uh, the event so successfully. Uh, they uh, hire very highly paid consultants uh, who do tactical research to figure out the best terms that they can use in order to present their ideas. Uh, they then filter them out through um, a network of owned media uh, and connections in fax machines, email lists, and telephone calls. So by the time the president gets onto the radio for his weekend radio address, the talking points and framing keywords that he wants, he's going to repeat in his speech, they've already appeared on the desks of news agencies across the country in every single Republican activist's uh, inbox. They find those talking points. Even college Republicans who only come to meetings once a month, if at all, somehow manage to get those key words that invoke uh, the big frames. So if you are um, a conservative corporation who has an interest in cutting down old growth forests um, in you know, the Pacific Northwest, uh, and you go to the Republican Party and say, we'd like to cut down America's heritage landscape, um, they will farm out that idea and then come back to you and say, look, we've got a way to frame this so that the American public might actually swallow this idea. We're not going to talk about cutting down heritage forests. We are going to talk about the problem of forest fires. Now, I'm sure many of you are concerned about the fact that there is just too much clutter in our old growth forests. And as you know, when there's all this clutter, a big problem happens that when there is a spark from lightning, which is, as you know, naturally occurring, um, when there's crowded old growth forests, um, that fire spreads at an alarming rate. And in fact, we are very behind on bringing our forests up to a healthy state. We have very unhealthy old growth forests, so we're going to advance a policy um, to make those forests healthier, healthy forests. And that's the idea that gets out there. Now, healthy forest means you cut down two-thirds of the old growth trees in those woods, um, ostensibly thinning them out. But that's what Republican framing looks like. And by the time it gets to Fox News, or by the time it gets to NBC, um, and is repeated uh, by Chris Matthews, uh, or repeated by any number of anchor people on CNN, not only can we, who are opposition voices to the conservatives, repeat those keywords and know exactly what they mean, but we seem, uh, by accident, in countering their arguments, to actually be giving it deeper legs. Uh, in our responses, even, to these cynical, dishonest framing efforts, we seem to advance their agenda. And we do that because we repeat the words that are thrown out there, not thinking that there is a system for holding the debate, a strategy uh, that can even accommodate strong negative reactions from incredibly intelligent progressive liberals and progressive Democrats. It's really something that you have to stand back in awe and look at its, its, its success. Um, so in writing about this um, on a daily basis, um, one of the things that I would do uh, is f try to figure out a way that I could frame issues without getting lost in the Republican spin itself. And so I developed this habit of giving myself what I called some breathing room. I would go to my safe place, as I called it. I had um, a small cache of speeches that I kept on the, my hard drive of my iBook, and I actually still keep them there. Um, a speech by FDR, a speech by Martin Luther King, a speech by John Kennedy. And I would read these speeches as a way of literally escaping from um, the current noise machine dominated by Republicans as a first step, uh, really a second step. First, I would stop repeating the words the Republicans were using, and then I would go to my safe place, uh, typically read a speech by FDR, uh, pick up some inspiration, and then I would sit down to do uh, what is a very, the very creative uh, and very difficult work of reframing 
a particular issue. So the seeds for framing the debate really uh, is that very simple maneuver that I found to be very successful. Um, it starts really with, with that speech uh, that I, have an, I devoted an entire chapter to, FDR's uh, 1933 inaugural speech, in which he uses uh, the phrase, we have nothing to fear uh, but fear itself. And of course, we're all familiar with this phrase because it's iconic. But you know, what's fascinating is that most Americans actually believe that that phrase is, references the Nazis in Europe. When FDR said, we have nothing to fear but fear itself, a lot of people believe that he is referring to the growing specter of fascism overseas. Well, in fact, he's not referring to that at all. Uh, he was referring to the United States economy. Remarkable, isn't it? He was standing up in his first inaugural address and decided in that speech to do no less than reframe the entire American conception of the economy. And he did it remarkably well. According to FDR, the problem that we had in the Great Depression was not that there wasn't enough money, was not that there wasn't enough resources to go around. We lived in a land that was a land of riches, embarrassingly full of plenty. The problem was that we were weighed down with a fear that emanated from investment bankers. Bankers were afraid to invest in small business because they were afraid that they were not going to get their collateral return. And so FDR stood up and he said, we have to do away with this fear and reinvigorate uh, our sense of what America is all about. America is not about investing in successful business. America is about achievement. It is about working on projects uh, together. So we need to reframe the entire idea of what it means to be an American citizen and what our purpose is now. With some time removed from that moment, we can see what FDR's real agenda was. FDR was looking to pass a series of bills through Congress that most people who held elected office at that time probably did not agree with. He was trying to pass public works programs. He was investing um, in a public labor force, uh, reworking our roads and highways, building dams, investing in jobs when most of the country thought that we were so deep in debt that we couldn't do anything but sit there and worry about where our next penny and our next meal was going to come from. And so the logic that I bring uh, to that speech is that there's a lot that we can learn as progressives, as, as Democrats, as liberals in the contemporary environment about um, framing current issues by reading these really masterful moments of rhetorical framing uh, from American history. But beyond that, I felt, uh, in, in, in based on my experience uh, looking at the types of discussions that were going on um, in, the, in the blogs, in the net roots, and on television, that Democrats had really lost touch with the American roots of what it is uh, that we were proposing. Uh, we had stopped talking about American heritage as if it was our own. So the other strategy in the book, beyond just giving Democrats and you know, progressives, Americans in general, a safe place where they could go to in order to get started uh, with framing on their own, I wanted to um, push the notion that for a progressive movement um, to really have a future, it needed to find its roots again uh, in American history. So this is my pitch for showing that progressive ideas don't just come from progressive thinkers nowadays or from the 60s, they extend all the way back to the origins of our republic, um, as, as does framing. I mean, I always tell this, this I use the same phrase when I, I do book events, but when we think about the Constitution, we don't refer to the writers of the Constitution or uh, the guys who sat around and talked about the Constitution. We call them the framers of the Constitution, right? So we have an idea here in framing which goes all the way back um, to the origins of our republic and a notion that um, it's not enough just to present ideas, but we need to think clearly uh, about how we're going to connect with what it is that we really want to say, what we really believe, and how to communicate that um, to a broad audience. Um, so I stumble upon this idea in my own work um, uh, and put it together in 15 chapters in the book um, analyzing key speeches. But there's another idea uh, at the base of the book, uh, which is the idea of participation. Um, the conclusion of, of the book is a chapter um, that I actually am, am particularly proud of, which I call the three P's of progressive politics. Um, those uh, those uh, P's being uh, participation, principle, and promise. But participation is the key because in reframing issues on a daily basis, as I do in my writing and as I do in the book, um, 
I realized uh, that framing is not just about um, finding the right answer. The way that progressives frame ideas is dramatically different than the way that Republicans do it. Republicans, as I described uh, in the beginning, they start out behind closed doors with uh, and, and generate the right answers, and then they feed those ideas down through their networks. And that seems to mesh uh, with what a lot of Republicans uh, who support the party, you know, movement conservatives, what they are looking for in political experience. They're very comfortable with receiving that wisdom from on high uh, and feel that they are contributing uh, to the success of their movement when they, uh, when they, they, they mouth those, those answers given to them. Um, as I'm sure you've all discovered, progressives are a little bit different. <laughs> progressives like um, to like to argue amongst ourselves. We bring a healthy debate to just about every single issue um, on the table. Um, in many ways, what progressives are looking to do when they're discussing politics um, is engage in deliberative democracy, not just do away with that participation, but join up um, either in formal or loosely organized institutions in order to hammer out what are the best ideas um, and then feed them up into our elected officials and into our uh, formal governmental institutions. So one of the things that's happened, one of the problems that we've suffered over years of kind of Republican rule uh, under George Bush and even before them is that there's been great damage done to our deliberative institutions. The notion uh, that everybody has a role to play participating in that deliberation has largely diminished. And so in the book, I make a very strong pitch uh, that framing is a step into deeper political engagement. Uh, and I talk about the growing movement, the growing number of people in the country who do as I do on a daily basis, who wake up and identify themselves as framers. They read the newspaper not just to find out what's uh, in the headlines, but they read the newspaper and they take down notes, they look for keywords that are being repeated, they cross-reference those words with other sources from government sources and what they're reading on the blogs, and then they participate, they respond right away. They write uh, either through the internet or on email lists, um, they talk about what they found and what they see as a problem, uh, a breaking Republican frame uh, that's attempting to control a discussion on a particular issue, um, and they speak back engaging that discussion and participating. So I make a strong pitch in the book uh, about framing being about participation, um, not just being about passive acceptance. And really, the broader goal of the book um, is not to propose a specific narrative that can stand for a party platform, but to encourage, um, at the level of a political movement, to encourage people to change their routines and to change their political habits to imagine ourselves as progressives, not just in terms of a core set of party platform issues, but in terms of a different set, uh, different set of political behaviors, uh, no longer simply accepting debate, uh, but seeing ourselves as responsible for it. Now, there's another uh, book out there called We the Media, uh, and this idea has been floating around for a while, the notion that we shouldn't just let reporters bring the news to us, but we should all, by virtue of broadband access and the ease by which we can contribute a story uh, to the discussion, we should all see ourselves as participating uh, in bringing the news uh, to the country. Um, and on some level, framing, as, as I understand it, is about that level of participation, but it's also about really stopping pausing and asking ourselves whether or not the ideas that are dominating the debate and the words that are holding them in place, whether those are our ideas and whether those should be the ideas that are out there or whether there should be an alternative. Um, and I believe that the simple act of asking that question um, and then speaking back by going uh, dipping back into American history, um, into some speeches by, uh, by our past presidents, and then looking back up and contributing a new idea, a new formulation uh, to the discussion um, can be incredibly transformative uh, for our system as a whole. Now, um, let me just touch briefly on a couple of the speeches, a couple of my favorite speeches that come up in the book. Um, a lot of times uh, when I have an opportunity to go out and speak to people, the first question I get is, you know, um, well, what, are, what is your favorite speech in the book? Um, and I told you already that the FDR speech is kind of my uh, you know, my, my, my safe place that I go to um, after reading the White House website um, for hours on end. Uh, but there are other speeches that I absolutely love, and let me just touch on a couple of those. Um, 
one of the speeches that I, that I write about, and I'm sure that some people uh, in this room um, uh, remember it, is Lyndon Johnson's 1964 speech in which he used the phrase, the Great Society. Um, uh, he, he gave uh, a commencement speech at the University of Michigan. And um, it's a great speech on a variety of levels. Uh, if you've never heard uh, Lyndon Johnson actually speak, uh, you know, I think that uh, because of, you know, uh, for understandable reasons, the history of the Vietnam War, I think that a lot of uh, Lyndon Johnson's uh, ability as a speaker uh, are, are trapped behind uh, his, his policies and, and the way he, he dealt with things uh, in that war. But you can actually download Lyndon Johnson's speech and listen to it on your iPod. Um, I don't think I'm the only one who rides the New York City subway listening to Lyndon Johnson on my iPod, but I think I'm one of the few. Um, but in that speech, one of, the, one of the amazing things that he does is that, you know, like FDR, Johnson was trying to pass a series of reforms that he called the Great Society, um, a series of programs, essentially, that were going to cost money, um, they were going to require investment. They were going to require a change in priorities. Um, they, and, and yet, rather than talking about what I call the blueprint, uh, instead, Johnson talked about the finished product. And he built uh, this idea in people's minds in that speech, uh, obviously together with the help of his speech writers. Um, and the speech uh, is absolutely, it's, it's breathtaking. He carries you along uh, throughout the entire, um, the entire time that he, that he is delivering it. Um, and talking about concepts which I believe still frame a lot of uh, democratic uh, ideas and democratic identity today. The notion that as Democrats, uh, what concerns us um, is uh, the health of our cities. Uh, what concerns us is the welfare of our, of our landscape. Uh, and what concerns us uh, is the constant um, uh, uh, opening up uh, of America's educational system. That you know, as citizens, we are, in, de in uh, uh, Johnson's words, we are soulless unless uh, we care for ourselves at the level of education, um, environment, uh, and urban development. It's really an amazing speech. And what's more amazing about it is that Johnson in there makes a passionate pitch about um, maintaining uh, values in that speech. And I found it remarkable. You go back in there and you think, huh, um, if only the Democrats had stopped for a moment and gone back in and read Johnson's speech and seen how it is that Democrats speak about values, how they connect them up to their ideas, then we would not have been overtaken uh, by uh, the appropriation of uh, the concept of values um, in, in the, uh, the discussion or in, in the framing put forth by the Republicans. Now, another great speech uh, that I love um, is uh, Thomas Jefferson's inaugural speech from 1801. In fact, I wrote about this today um, in, a, in a blog piece that I put up about um, our vice president, um, who, uh, and in the piece, I talk about how uh, Dick Cheney um, apparently has strict rules for the press, that if you follow, um, if you have the, the misfortune of following Dick Cheney around the country, um, in this case, going to Baghdad and asking him questions, then before you ask a question and before the microphones go on, uh, there are a set of ground rules that are put out there. You're not allowed to ask this. You're not allowed to ask that. Um, and there's real punishment if you break the vice president's media rules. Um, and I thought to myself, huh. Uh, this seems very strange because I was brought up with the understanding uh, that one of the rock bed American principles is freedom of the press. Uh, that the press doesn't do the bidding of our vice president simply because he says, if you don't follow my rules, then you can't ride around on my airplane. Um, instead, uh, we do the bidding of our Constitution, um, that the press follows this, this rock bed principle. So I went back and I read a speech. Um, that I had in the book, uh, Thomas Jefferson's inaugural from 1801, after what was a very, very contentious election, in which Jefferson thought it was important just to remind everybody what the foundational principles were of the republic. You know, hey, everybody, I realize we've been fighting for a while here. Uh, tough election, I understand. A lot of money was spent here. Um, but these are the principles on which this republic was founded. And he just listed them off, freedom of religion, um, freedom of press. Uh, right there in Jefferson's speech. And here we have our, you know, our vice president overturning that. So I love going back to Jefferson's speech, um, but also because right now, uh, whether you realize it or not, the Republicans are busy trying to reframe Thomas Jefferson as the great kind of font of uh, modern conservative thinking. Shocking to learn, isn't it? Um, in uh, George Allen's uh, failed bid for a reelection in the state of Virginia, he repeated the phrase, um, Jefferson conservative over and over again. And he kept on using this phrase, wise and frugal government, as if to convince us all that when Jefferson talked about a wise and frugal government, what he meant was, you know, we shouldn't have a lot of social programs. I mean, can you imagine Thomas Jefferson back then thinking, you know, 
Um, you really got to watch uh, Social Security spending here in 1801. So there you have and a classic example of, of the Republicans actively trying uh, to deceptively frame uh, Thomas Jefferson. If you actually read that speech, um, what Thomas Jefferson says about a wise and frugal government is he says that we have almost unlimited resources and land in this country. We have everything that we need in order to be successful as a republic. The only thing that doesn't come ready-made is a wise and frugal government. It's the key piece. It is what completes the circle. It's what makes the American project possible to succeed, a wise and frugal government. So we have to be very careful to make sure that that wise government is in place. The exact opposite of the idea that we should be breaking down the government, making it smaller, and getting it out of the way of the success of the free markets, this Republican notion. Incredible how the Republicans can turn that idea on its head. Um, and just one last final example, um, Eisenhower's farewell speech, uh, his 1961 televised speech, uh, which I think is one of the most prophetic speeches uh, given by an American president. And you can also download this online. You can watch the video in which you see um, a noticeably older Eisenhower uh, give a speech in the voice of a senior statesman that literally foretells all of the problems uh, that we're having in today's world. Now, most of us know that speech for the iconic phrase that he used, the speech, the military-industrial complex. But most people don't remember the frame uh, that was in that speech. Over and over again, Eisenhower repeated uh, the same basic idea, and it's the notion of balance, what I call the balance frame. Um, that American policy progresses forward when it is in balance, and it enters great crisis when it is out of balance. And he defines what balance is in a variety of ways. Um, in terms of our foreign policy, he said that our policy would be in great danger if it was dramatically out of balance, if it was in, entirely in the control of corporations. And then he called that the military-industrial complex, instead of being uh, in, in the hands of a wide variety of senior statesmen uh, and competent strategists. Um, it would be out of balance if we did not include even the weakest nation states at the table. Uh, a passionate kind of endorsement of, of international law, endorsement of the idea of that diplomacy should include Remarkably, even people uh, that are not capable of coming to the table on their own. We should make a place not just for our enemies, but make a place for people who maybe could not even make a place for themselves. He talked about the danger of research growing out of balance, research being dominated by large government grants, uh, that research should be uh, not just entirely in, um, uh, be put at, at, at the beck and call of, of large government grants. Um, but he said that that would lead to uh, a belief uh, that all of our social problems could be solved uh, with technological and scientific solutions instead of being solved by working together uh, and by forming uh, that great American idea, uh, the notion of collective participation, community, uh, uh, call it what you will. So Eisenhower's speech is one that I, that I go back to. Um, and I go back to it particularly now. I mean, there's a story in the press um, uh, just in the past couple of days, this, this, this tragic disaster in Kansas where an entire uh, uh, small town uh, was destroyed by tornadoes. Now, of course, tornadoes are not the fault of the Republican Party um, that I've been able to find out uh, so far. Um, but uh, what we discover uh, in listening to how that story is being reported is that there's a real problem. I was listening to the governor of Kansas, and what she was saying was that the problem isn't that um, she doesn't have enough National Guard's uh, uh, reserves to send out and help people. There appear to be plenty of people, although not as many as there should be. The problem is that there's not enough trucks. There's not enough backhoes. There's not enough equipment because the deployment of the National Guard is so dramatically out of balance with what it was designed for. Uh, through extended uh, tours of duty, uh, all the equipment is overseas. Um, and so uh, she is having trouble responding to this natural disaster, having trouble responding to the weather because uh, of the, the horrible, imbalanced uh, uh, Bush foreign policy. What a great example. What a great opportunity to go back uh, to an American president like Dwight Eisenhower, you know, people often ask me, how do you speak to Republicans who are movement conservatives? And I always say, well, um, talk about Eisenhower. You know, Eisenhower is someone who is widely respected. You know, there was a time in this country um, when 
uh, Americans supported presidents and candidates beyond just their political party allegiance. There was a time uh, when presidents did not just see their time in office as an opportunity to extend the authority of their individual party, um, where they saw foreign policy as a chance to bring wars to a close, not to open up more wars. So there is a heritage out there, um, and this is a great opportunity, I think, to invoke um, that speech from Eisenhower. So um, uh, Jefferson, Lyndon Johnson, and Eisenhower are a few of my, uh, my favorite favorite uh, speeches. Now let me just uh, close before we turn to some questions and answers with one story, which is that um, people often ask me, you know, it, it's great if we do this, um, you know, if I wake up every day and I read, read the, the news and I speak back, it's wonderful that, that I'm able to do that, but does it really have an impact? Does it really change things? Are we making headway? You know, they've got uh, the Fox News Network, they seem to control more and more media on a daily basis. Um, and I like to tell what I call my grandmother story. And this is actually a true story about my own grandmother. When my book came out, um, I gave a copy of the book um, to several copies to my, to my family. Um, and my mother uh, distributed copies to, I've got two uh, beautiful grandmothers. And my, uh, my grandmother, who's 93 years old, who lives in an assisted living facility in um, suburban Detroit, um, she called me up on the phone a couple weeks after, the, after she got the book. Now, I have to say that I'm close with my grandmother, but she never calls me on the telephone. Um, I tend to call her. So I called her back, and I said, Grandma, what, um, what's up? And she said, well, I was reading Newsweek the other day, and I saw an article about health care policy. And in that article, the Newsweek writer said, and she picked up, I could hear the rustling of the paper, she picked it up and said, in order for the Democrats to win on health care, they're going to need to frame the debate. And she said, she said, I said to myself, wait a minute, this Newsweek just came out this week. And Jeffrey's book came out three weeks ago, Newsweek is plagiarizing my grandson. <laughs> now, the reason I tell this story is not, you know, to kind of uh, give my, put my grandmother into the, into the text here, but that my grandmother, that phone call from my grandmother came to me by way of, you know, me writing about framing on the internet over a period of years, um, getting the idea to write a book, giving my book to my family members who are the, the antithesis of political activists. My parents in the past have voted for Republicans. They're not committed partisan uh, progressive movement uh, folks who then distributed the books throughout my hometown community. My grandmother read a political book about framing. Uh, my grandmother, who is, uh, I don't think she has voted in, in, in recent time because she just simply is not, uh, she hasn't gotten around to it. Uh, my grandmother then picked up the phone and called my father to ask, her, to ask him first about this, um, my grandmother and my father having a political discussion about the framing of political language. My, my grandmother then calls me uh, to tell me the story, and then I call my father to confirm that story. My goodness, if we're not making headway based on that, <laughs> then I don't know what to say. I mean, that's just one example of one thing that's happening in one family. But I really do believe, and this is not just kind of idealism floating you know, uh, above the ground here, I really believe uh, that this is the impact uh, that this type of work can have. Um, that Americans are deeply, deeply committed uh, to the idea of a deliberative democracy and the idea of not just being passive, but participating. What has driven the rise of the net roots, what has driven the rise of a movement uh, of framers across this country is a frustration that there has not been enough opportunity for participation and that we have been left behind. That politics has been something that for reasons uh, beyond our control for the past decade or so has taken place almost entirely um, in institutions with an incredibly high buy-in price. Either you have a lot of money uh, or you have a big corporation or you're, you're, you run a large institution or your voice just isn't heard. Um, and I hope uh, that in some small way, uh, framing the debate can contribute uh, to the growth of that movement so we can hear many more grandmother stories uh, and we can push that back. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> but I should announce uh, we have a, a microphone. So if you do have a question, please raise your hand and then um, a friendly runner from C-SPAN will come around. When you were, hello. <laughs> um, when you were speaking about the Republican version of framing, you talked about this kind of very top-down process in which a cabal meets and filters things out until they have talking points, and then they come down to the news media, and then everyone calls John Kerry a flip-flopper. Yeah. Um, and then when you were talking about kind of the progressive response to that, you were talking about this sea of voices that would maybe respond one-on-one, one-by-one, -on -one, framing their own. Um, 
the, framing the debate their own way. Um, how can that match a kind of at least seemingly unified conservative framing? The, the short answer to your question is it, it can match it over time. Uh, in other words, you know, what I, I like to say by qualifying it that you know, the goal of progressive framing is not to just reproduce the Republican model. The, the grand vision of, of, a, of, a, of a, the, a frame that I put forward in the book and that you'll find in other books on framing, you know, in, in, in the George's books, is not that you know, 10 years down the road it'll be Democrats who have the, the smoky dark rooms in which we control the media and all the fax machines and, and, and the email lists. It's that we are able uh, to, to reinvigorate uh, the general public's understanding of what goes on out there and, and, and also to take on, you know, the media in general in order, you know, speaking back to the media so that, that uh, the fertile ground for that type of framing is no longer there. In terms of kind of individual events, uh, you know, that's something that I like to refer to as tactical framing in which, you know, the way that you respond um, uh, to the framing from Republicans is to do it very quickly um, and to get uh, organized um, uh, so that you're ready when it happens. Um, you know, I write about, um, on my site, Frame Shop, I write about, uh, uh, have written several essays about responding to what we call swift boating. You know, what happened to John Kerry in the last election where, you know, here we have a decorated war hero who gets framed as a coward, as a liar, um, as a turncoat, uh, which is this old concept that conservatives have been pulling out for quite a long time. Um, and the advice that I give about, about reframing that is, is basically to say, look, if we wait until the next candidate we have, is swift boated, it's too late. So we have to get started right now. We, you know, put someone in charge of the effort who is not on a particular individual campaign um, and to do, you know, kind of a reconnaissance work to, to, to know the landscape of who's out there on a daily basis to do that research to find out, well, who are the organizations that are going to get busy um, tar and feathering our candidates when the time comes up? Who will be our candidates? Uh, that have military records who might be susceptible to this, and then generating uh, those initial responses. I mean, I talk about um, you know the, the progressive frame in response uh, to uh, to swift boating is not simply to say John Kerry was a hero when they say no he wasn't, but to talk about um, the damage uh, that these types of groups, what I call gangs, these conservative gangs, do to American faith uh, in politics in general. I mean, this is really a fear tactic. Uh, that these highly paid conservative groups are using in order to intimidate people um, from participating in politics. And so shifting the debate to that particular idea, uh, which actually uh, takes root very quickly, um, catches the attention of people in the media, and is something that can rise up through the ranks of citizen, uh, you know, internet and, and, and blogs in order to control those issues. So long-term as well as short-term tactical reframing, and, you know, we can hold uh, both individual issues like that and the bigger issues. Uh, this is a question about a particular argument in a particular frame. The, the argument that we have to fight them there be, or else we'll have to fight them here. Or if we leave, they'll follow us. It seems that that particular type of argument has no real counter because it has no real base. And it works, in my opinion, in the, you know, the lizard brain area, not in the reason area. Because you, know, you can say, that's what they said in Vietnam. Well, this, is, this didn't happen after Somalia, but it doesn't really work. So how does that frame work, and how do you break it? Yeah, I mean, just let me first, um, there's another question there, which is about the lizard brain. So let me answer the, uh, let me address the lizard brain comment first. I mean, I think that uh, one of the things that's really important to, to, to be aware of is something that I call the stupid problem. And the stupid problem is essentially, we think they're stupid, and that's our problem. So, I mean, the, 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 the reason that the, um, the, the, that particular frame, they're going to, you know, we have to fight them over here, over there, so we don't have to fight them over here. The first frame, uh, you know, this what I call the kind of linebacker frame, this notion that the U.S. military is this line of, you know, of a defense line, that if we pull one person off that front line, that's it. They all come running over the line. So we've got to keep everybody there, otherwise we're in trouble. And the other one, which I, I call the kind of the sticky terrorist frame, uh, which is this notion that, you know, we turn around uh, and we come home after, after we, we, we pull troops out, and all the terrorists are, are strangely attached to us so that when we get back here, we turn around and they're, they're, they're here with us. Um, this notion that they just follow us along, they rush in after us. Um, you know, and, and you're right, simply responding doesn't seem to cut that. I mean, let me, let me give you what I think has been a, good, a fairly good response so far. Um, initially, uh, Senator Russ Feingold, you know, several years back, he began talking about uh, foreign uh, uh, def uh, uh, national defense in terms of a chessboard metaphor in which he said, look, danger 
uh, that's out there is not just going to come on one square of the chessboard. Uh, in order to be successful in our defense, we have to look all over the board. We have to play uh, the entire game. So the first, I think, uh, challenge in terms of reframing that particular issue uh, is to redefine national security in terms of something that is beyond one particular location. Um, our national defense doesn't depend entirely on one policy in one place. It depends on a broad range of issues the entire board. This idea came up in another way in the Democratic, um, the first Democratic event with all the candidates, um, in which the notion um, that uh, a foreign policy is about, well, there are more dangers than just in Iraq came up, the same idea of Feingold's frame. Um, and then uh, John Edwards, I thought, had a, had a good uh, uh, phrasing in which he talked about uh, using all the tools at our disposal. Now, in the uh, in, the, in that particular discussion, all the candidates have been saying that we all need to go out and talk to people. Uh, we need to have more active diplomacy. Um, but when Edwards said, look, we need to use all the tools in our disposal, that invoked a question uh, in a lot of people's minds that I spoke to afterwards, which was, huh, you know, I hadn't really thought about that. What other tools should we be using? And the second that the debate switched to that question, uh, then uh, that Republican frame seemed to have lost a lot of its force when people were suddenly asking, well, what else can we use? Where else can we go? Instead of, oh my goodness, if we move ever so slightly, uh, then there's going to be an even greater danger. So shifting from uh, to that, and in technical terms in foreign policy, that's shifting to a regional uh, emphasis there. Um, but the broader idea, the broader frame is this notion that foreign policy is something which takes place all over the board. Um, it involves uh, a broad range of tools, diplomatic uh, and military, um, and that those dangers um, then go away. Uh, much more than just slogans, but about invocation of deeper ideas and values. And yet, as someone who writes a lot on the Daily Coast, I see a common misunderstanding of framing among the net roots as being about sloganeering and coming up with quick and easy retorts to uh, these kinds of things like they'll follow us home. Do you see that same problem on, uh, within the, the net root community? And if so, what can we do to uh, deepen their understanding of what framing really is all about? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I, I do see that problem out there. because, And I think that one of the reasons that it is out there has to do with the nature of the medium of blogs. Um, and here you have uh, a particular interactive media uh, which is based on a very quick response. And a lot of times you have, you know, what when you come into these discussions after they've already happened, you don't get a sense for how fast-paced uh, they 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 are when they unfold, and it it that the the big blogs like the Daily Coast, um, they tend to attract someone who's who's very passionate about kind of quick response tactical politics. So they want to take a few ideas and they want to get right back out on the ground. They want to not just tell a bunch of people what they've picked up, uh, either from an expert or, or from their community, but they want to use it in a local campaign. They want to use it on the ground. Um, so in order for framing that begins with principles, that begins with values, that begins with, with broad I ideas that are out there, um, I think that it's just a matter of occupying that space and shifting its nature ever so slightly. I mean, one of the great things about the net roots is that it's an open source uh, environment so that anybody can show up and they can contribute to that discussion. So, you know, let me give one example um, of the past couple weeks. There's been uh, this incident with pet food poisoning, this whole discussion uh, about uh, the Chinese produced melamine, which is a, a toxin that has ended up in chicken feed uh, and ended up, you know, it killed some pets. And then there was a big discussion about the, the human, uh, uh, the food chain for, for ourselves. You know, are we eating toxic chicken? And then there was another article that came out about, uh, about salmon farming, how that this melamine might have gotten into the farm salmon. And suddenly on the blogs, there was a lot of writing about how we can, you know, talk about the, the danger in the food, the food supply. And it was a great opportunity for, uh, you know, frame people who are involved in more long-term framing to step into that environment, to post in that shorter format, and to talk about the frame of healthy food. Um, you know, the notion of, you know, uh, shared responsibility, you know, globalism versus localism, and all the big ideas that we need to have out there. And it's really in that environment that I think the deeper ideas begin uh, to take root, when people feel a sense of urgency because of what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis, but then the larger ideas are ready and there for people to pick up. There's a question up front, and then a question that we'll start with one in the back. 
Yes, the next question in the back. Uh, do you have any advice for particularly those of us working uh, with grassroots uh, grassroots activists in overcoming the distaste for framing, particularly for people who don't see the difference between framing and lying? Advice for overcoming the distaste. Well, um, if you throw me a softball, I would say absolutely you should all buy the book Framing the Debate, um, and you will overcome that distaste, um, and it will be enjoyable to do so. But uh, no, seriously, um, the I think that a lot of the deception uh, about what framing is comes from, and this, this may sound uh, disingenuous when I say it, but the way that framing has been framed itself uh, uh, on the right. I mean, the, the what you find a lot of times is that in the critiques um, that are that are published, you know, when I write about a framing a particular issue, there's oftentimes an embedded argument out there um, that the media is somehow receiving these framing efforts uncritically from power, the power structure and transmitting it on to a public, and that that act of doing so is causing great damage. And so what you get in response to that what, what is, is, a, is a backlash from a lot of times from journalists who see themselves in very different in a very different light. And, and journalists, um, not surprisingly, are very um, good at getting their narratives out <laughs> out there. So the idea, for example, that framing is not about um, engaging ideas and participating and generating clearer, more accurate, and more honest uh, political uh, uh, concepts, uh, but that it's actually about deception, it's about um, somehow uh, scientific conditioning of the brain, or that people who are involved in framing have no respect uh, for the American electorate. That idea is out there because it gets repeated um, uh, all, oftentimes for people who feel the sting uh, of the critiques uh, that, that often come along with this type of writing. So I would say get them involved in actually reading uh, what goes on in framing. You know, walk them through uh, the analysis and show them that framing is really about clear thinking and that framing is, is really what is at the heart of the great iconic uh, moments in, in, in successful American politics. You know, when I take someone, um, I give a workshop and I walk people through um, one of the speeches in the book, you know, I walk them through the Gettysburg Address, for example, and I say, look, you know, here is a speech that we've all, uh, you know, had to memorize in school, as school children we memorized it. Uh, you know, government for the people, of the people, by the people. Um, but when I say, you know, uh, when a word is repeated over and over again in uh, a rhetoric, that's typically a sign that the speaker is trying to frame a broader concept. And I say, you know, what, what, what Lincoln is trying to do in that speech is he's trying to get across the idea uh, that the rock bed American principle that we fight wars for is the notion of representative democracy. That's why we fight wars. Um, and that's the notion that's invoked by that phrase that we all memorized. And, you know, almost, you know, to the, to, to the one people in that moment, they say, oh, that's what framing is. I, I thought it was deceptive. So you're saying that Lincoln really was just kind of clarifying those ideas because, of course, there's no deception going on in that speech. So, so bring them away from the, de the, the critique and the counter critique that they're getting uh, in, the, in the media because people's feelings have been hurt and show them really what you can do with framing and what's been done before. And I think you'll get, uh, you'll get a bunch of them in the room with you. There's another question up front. I want to wait for the C-SPAN microphone to get to you. My question has less to do with government than business. Uh, comment on framing in relationship to the tobacco industry or the insurance industry. I'll, I'll take the insurance industry. <laughs> uh, I think we, uh, the insurance industry, um, you know, is, is a great example of how effective corporate framing can really limit our ability to solve the most basic problems that as Americans we have more than enough ingenuity to, to resolve. Um, you know, when I, when I think about insurance, I think about the problem of, of health in this country. Um, and when you listen to the discussion about health, about, about American, the health of Americans, um, there is not a single discussion that goes on um, in, the, in the public square, on TV or in government, that does not instantly invoke the idea that fundamentally we're talking about money. Um, the idea that health care in this country is really a conversation about cash, about dollars and cents. Um, and it's, it's a remarkable testament to the success of uh, the insurance industry in framing the entire uh, question of American health in terms of an industry that profits them in an incredibly hierarchical structure. Um, and I often send people back to, um, to the FDR speech, the 1933 inaugural speech, in which um, it was articulating the principles of the New Deal, uh, in which, you know, I, I go back to that moment because there FDR was saying that the economy should not, we should not talk about the economy in terms of money. 
we should talk about the economy in terms of the core idea uh, th that, that is the basis for American citizenship, and that is that we should all be uh, working, uh, and we should all have a sense of achievement, and that sense of achievement uh, helps build a collective sense of happiness, that the purpose of, of American life is, is that happiness. It's not building wealth. Um, and I, I like to talk about a new deal for American health in which we switch from a discussion uh, of money and affordability and we talk about, um, about healthy bodies, about well-being, uh, about more access and so forth. And you know, a lot of times I actually get, um, this, is, this is a very hard uh, idea for, for committed progressive activists to pick up because the discussion in health care over the past few years has gotten quite sophisticated. So you'll find real progressive activists committed to the idea of not uh, uh, just mimicking Republican frames or conservative frames, um, and you will, you'll find them instantly invoke that notion of money. And I just say, look, you know, we should be talking about uh, the purpose of health care, which is to be healthy. Uh, you know, the problem uh, when you get sick is that you need to get better. You need to get healthy again. Uh, you need to have, a, you know, have access to a doctor. And when you actually listen to people um, uh, talk about their experience in the, in the health care system, um, sure, they say they can't afford to have health insurance, but when they get sick, what they say is, um, you know, I was afraid to go to the doctor. And then they say, well, I went to the emergency room. Um, so they tell a story. When people are sick who don't have insurance, they tell a story about finding ways um, to, to heal uh, that involve, uh, you know, using this, the system of healthcare providers that are out there. They don't talk about going and scraping up money, or they don't tell the story about how ultimately, you know, the, the emergency room said, okay, well, we'll cover you with, with, with another, another policy. They just talk about getting better and, and what that brought to them. So, you know, our goal in, 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 in framing this issue is to get back to that discussion uh, where we talk about health in terms of people um, um, getting better and people having, you know, confidence in doctors again, where people saying, you know, I feel bad, let's go to the doctor because he's really helpful, you know, reclaiming that idea that the American, uh, you know, medical provider is, is a hero in our communities, not someone to be feared because going near them might cause you uh, the, the shame or the embarrassment of not having insurance. Um, and getting away from the idea that our, um, our nation collectively is threatened by the specter of long-term long chronic illness that, that could make us all uh, uh, um, debilitatingly uh, impoverished uh, at a minute's notice. Um, so uh, so that's, how I, that's how I kind of take up that, uh, that idea and move away from that insurance frame. Get the microphones. We have question one, two, and then three. Um, do you think that some of the power of the Republican frames may come about um, because it seems like at least some of them are really um, have a kernel of truth with a lie wrapped around it? So, for example, the the Healthy Forests Initiative. Um, you know, the thing that the concern about tinder loading in the, in forests is true. The need to maintain those forests is legitimate. Um, the lie comes when they propose that a company can actually make money doing, you know, removing scrub growth and, and, and acting in a way that is actually going to be good for the forest. And it's, 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 you know, something that needs to be seen as a form of maintenance of our natural resources, not as a profit-making opportunity. And that's where the lie comes in. But I'm, I'm wondering if that's an effective, if, I'm wondering, first of all, if you, in having looked at so many frames, have seen this to be a consistent pattern, truth, 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 lie, and if you think it's an effective way to break down the frame by finding the place where you step from truths into lies and pointing people at that particular spot. Yeah, it's a great question. And really, if I can, if I can rephrase it just a little bit here, it is, it is the, the, the question about, about the role of lies in political debate and what we should do about that. You know, I, this is, again, one of the, a question that I get quite often. You know, when we are confronted with lies, from, from you know, conservatives, why, when we just call out the lies, doesn't that seem to be an effective, effective way of doing things? Um, yeah, I mean, just kind of go back to the first part of your question about, you know, a, 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 I think the way you phrased it was used like, like a bacon wrap metaphor, kind of truth wrapped around with, with lies. Um, you know, I mean, but that really, you know, that lie is what makes the whole thing false, doesn't it? I mean, the, the, the notion in healthy forests is that, you know, irrespective of what potential benefit that thinning out of the trees was about. The policy that they were putting forward was a straightforward falsity. I mean, it was entirely about a policy that would enable greater profit taking uh, in an industry that was not necessarily welcome. So if the real goal was 
thinning out of the trees, uh, we have departments in our government to look after that, and that uh, you know that would in ostensibly be uh, what, what we're after. But um, in general, I find that it's more effective to talk about principles and values than it is simply to point out lies. Um, simply saying that something is not true uh, tends to open up uh, the counter remark when someone says, well, I think it is true. Uh, and and in, in reality, you know, politics is, is about partisan allegiance. And so you'd be surprised how many people will look at something that, that you view as a straightforward, clear-cut lie. And they will look at it and they'll say, you know what, I really I really deeply believe it's true. And then it puts you in a situation where you have to essentially question a person's entire belief structure uh, in order to get them to not see something that's true. Um, but if instead you, you turn to the question of principles and you point out how the principle that a particular policy advances is not necessarily a good one, um, then you tend to push them along uh, and you, you tend to be more persuasive. And let me give you, since that's an abstract idea, let me give you a quick example of what I mean by that um, in the Iraq policy. What we're seeing now um, is that a lot of, uh, uh, you know, majority of the country looks at the Iraq policy and sees it wrong. Um, but there's less people in the country who are willing to look at what the president does and say, well, he's just outright lying. Uh, there are people on the left who, you know, who will say, yes, he's lying, and it's very clear, and some people in the media. Um, but there are a lot of people on the right who are still reluctant to answer to that particular argument, to say that, uh, you know, th that's a lie. And again, it's your kind of truth wrapped in a, uh, in, in a, uh, in a lie idea. You know, and, and what Bush often lies about is, well, we're doing a job, uh, you know, we're doing something here, and we, we, sh we have to finish it. If we, if we uh, constantly are interrupting what he calls our commanders on the ground, that's going to be problematic. And, you know, the, the, the reality is, that, well, you know, that is a little bit of a kernel of truth. They don't want to be constantly interrupting people. want to have them do their job. They're hard because they can do a good job. But the principle that's the problem at the heart of all that is the notion that only one person in this country has any say about in our foreign policy. It's, the, it's this, this, this Republican, or this, this Bush Cheney idea of the unitary executive that has advanced. Um, you know, some people would argue that this war has advanced that policy, um, and you know, instead of you know that policy advancing the war, uh, and you say to people, look, um, you know, the the problem here, whether you think Bush is lying or not, is that this entire approach to government is completely flawed. I mean, do you really believe in this principle of unitary executive? Do you believe that the, that the president is the only person that has a say in our foreign policy in this particular issue? And I'm not saying that every, every conservative who, who would not accept the lie argument will go along with that, but that is an argument on the basis of principle, a very deeply held principle in our uh, uh, American idea of government, which is the division of powers. Um, and it's not about oversight. Um, it's not about who's telling the truth and who's not, but it's about how government should be. And when you move people to that terrain, you'd be surprised at how many conservatives are willing to concede the point on those terms uh, and to start talking about change in the policy, which is the goal, ultimately, when you're having that discussion. Um, and there is a principle at stake in every policy. And so the hard work is being prepared in order to find it. And of course, we don't all have time to be prepared uh, with everything, and we can't say, you know, um, Give me five minutes, I'll be back. Do you want to go read that, you know, chapter 13 in Feldman's book? So I can come back and, you know, tell you what the principle is here. Um, but that's what, why I talk about framing it as a daily thing rather than just something that happens, you know, once a month or behind closed doors. That if we get in the habit of seeing the principles at the basis of these discussions, um, then we are much more nimble uh, in those moments. Yes? I just wanted to do a sort of follow up on this manipulation of fear in what I guess this guy referred to as the lizard brain. And, and in terms of the, the uh, health care issue, I, I did a story when California had it on the ballot for single payer. And I, I got all the PR from both sides, the framing from both sides. And they were so effective. At, and, and I don't think you're, 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 you're saying that, well, people are thinking, well, what, what what is healthy and so that's not what they've appealed to they appealed to that lizard side where the ads from the hospital industry and the insurance industry had I'll just give you an example how the, this was framed was the uh, a, a, a newscaster uh, asking a question at a hospital after it had passed single payer in California had passed and there was a huge long slinking line outside the hospital waiting to get in just to sit down just to sit down. People, and, and asking one guy, well, so what's your issue? Well, it's not me, it's my wife. She needs a replacement hip. Um, they think she, uh, walking's not important. I think walking's important, but what do I know? 
So everybody who has Blue Cross or Prudential, which is probably most voters have something, are thinking, okay, this is what, okay, we'll all have this kind of uh, Bolshevik whatever, where it's like bring your own sheets and pay for your own doctor and hope that you can even get anything because you have to share. There's not enough scarcity, I guess you would call it. And it worked. It scared a, a, a majority of Californians into voting against it. The fear being that, okay, this is what you want. Um, those of you who are covered, who are voters, which is probably the majority of voters, and they rejected it. How do you, how do you get around this manipulation of fear, whether it's that or you look at Iraq. They're going to come after us here and be in our backyards. And people start after 9-11. It's a, it's a tra traumatized nation that watched all this. And, 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 and th this reasoning side that you're talking about is cut out because the other side has just taken over. That's that, uh, that survival side of us, which is more animal-like, which is like, oh, no. And then so all this framing cuts out. How do you get around that to where you get the front cortex to take over again when they are dealing in fear and doing a good job of it? Oh, they do a good job. I mean, I can say my professional opinion as an anthropologist about the survival side. I'm not so sure that, 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 I, would, that I would put it that way. But, I mean, what you talk about, I mean, the description of people in line, when I think of people waiting in line um, in a healthcare system, I think of, you know, senior citizens in Florida waiting in line for their flu shot. So I would call that not a Bolshevik uh, healthcare system. I would call it a Bush Cheney healthcare uh, model of people waiting in line at drugstores in that case. But you know what, what you're what you're what you're drawing out there. I mean, I think even beyond the manipulation by fear, because by the time it gets to um, to that for the production of those commercials, um, then the ideas have already been generated. I mean, uh, as, as a phrase that I often repeat when I when I when I give this kind of um, uh, talks to to kind of activist groups is, you know, think big and hit first uh, in in those types of, of of initiatives. So if you've got a ballot initiative that's coming out. You know, what the Republican framing effort did in that moment was, you know, they leapt to that idea that has worked for them before, you know, that they put in place as a result of past ideas, this notion that, you know, uh, a single-payer health care system will result in a socialist system where the quality goes dramatically down. Um, they've put that in place in past efforts. They had it there because of, you know, attacking Hillary Clinton when she, when she worked on that during the Clinton administration. Um, and... Uh, so they just called up, made a few phone calls, and they put out that ad, and, and they got it out there, and that was the narrative that held uh, the particular story. Now, did that narrative appeal to people's sense of fear? I don't know. I mean, I think it's hard to know exactly why it is that, that, that it works. I mean, I, I wouldn't say, you know, again, I wouldn't call it a lizard brain side of it, but it's just that was, those were the rules for the discussion that were set. Once it was put out there, uh, it was very hard to dislodge. So, you know, what pro successive progressive framing for health care uh, will need to think far in advance of um, a particular ballot initiative and put out an alternative idea out there. You know, what we think of when we think of reinventing the healthcare system is, 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 is a lot more opportunities for people to find care. Uh, you know, in other words, rethinking uh, the entire notion of what it means to have good care in this country. You know, more clinics, smaller clinics, you know, have moving health care into uh, places where, where people are so they don't actually have to go in, in, out and in, in wait in line. You know, more, you know, uh, registered nurses in schools, you know, in, in, in companies, you know, people being covered, taking more care and control, lowering the cost of, of, um, of pharmaceuticals. Um, you know, in general, the, the policies that you put out there uh, are what come first, and then from that, it generating the ads. So, I mean, I, I also like to make a distinction saying, I'm not an ad man. I mean, my, I, don't, I don't generate ads, and I'm not saying that, you know, by being a framer, I am better than the communications team uh, that is in charge of these particular uh, type of, of areas. I'm just saying that unless we are aware of the broader framing of issues, unless there is a framer on the committee of an election campaign or on the committee of a nonprofit in charge of raising awareness about progressive initiatives, then the Republicans, the insurance companies, they get the jump and their story gets out there first. You know, like you said, by the time you've set that stage, it's very hard uh, to go back and you're left in a game of catch up. So, you know, framing goes hand in hand with getting there first. You really do have to get out there and show people what that alternative is. You know, I mean, another point that I talk about in the book, I talk about it in the Johnson chapter, is that Democrats, they like to talk about the blueprint. Uh, they like to talk about the, the, what their, you know, the great programs are going to do, but they don't, they stop short of saying, well, what, what's it going to look like once the building has been constructed? You know, what is the experience of interacting with the healthcare system? 
once uh, progressives have reinitiated it and made it into something better than what we want. It certainly isn't long lines. It certainly isn't low quality. Um, it's about proximity to, to, to health care. It's about having greater access. It's about more resources available to you um, as part of a variety of different communities that you belong to, your school, your job, uh, your local neighborhood. Um, you know, it's, it's about um, watching over our food supply, making sure that it's healthy. It's about making sure that we all take responsibility uh, for maintaining our health, uh, looking out for obesity and, and, and so forth. So, you know, painting a picture of that and putting that image out there um, is a way to bring people in. It's not just about triggering those levers that make people afraid, um, but it's about getting there first uh, and setting the rules. I'll take, uh, we'll take a couple more questions. One question up front. We have a microphone coming to you. I couldn't help uh, notice that you're standing in front of all these pattern books, and uh, essentially what you're talking about in framing is framing a pattern. It's a basic course in pattern recognition, and then, then um, figuring out which patterns are being put together and if they're being used in a modular manner and, and dissecting the whole thing and deconstructing it and, and uh, alleviating people's fear by saying, look, this isn't a new quilt. This is the old log cavern pattern. We have nothing to fear from these quilters out in G's bends and there's nothing, there's nothing new in the big book of new design. So seems like what we should do is enlist our artists and the people that are expert in pattern recognition and get these things dissected and deconstructed and get people out on the internet and then get someone to hand out the, the results on a street corner for people that aren't connected. It's a matter of uh, using our participation and our strengths, which are not necessarily just linguistic and verbal strengths, but also artistic and, uh, and design creation strengths. Thank you. Yeah, that's, um, that's a good way of putting it, uh, definitely. I mean, I think of, of framing as a basic uh, idea um, about understanding the meaning of terms in the context of other terms. So what I, what I do a lot uh, in my analysis is I simply um, locate what I think are particularly important words and talk about how those invoke br bigger ideas that are either in the same context of a given narrative, you know, there's other words in that speech, or also invoke bigger ideas and bigger narratives both in history and in the political discussion writ large. So it is about seeing how individual concepts or words or ideas fit into a broader pattern. And then doing that, as, as you pointed out, um, as, as, a, as a path to taking a greater control of that and, and being able to advance it for a broader social purpose. So you know, the, the logic here is not just to find the meaning of these terms and these big ideas for the sake of doing it, you know, not just analysis for analysis sake, but out of the belief that if we are able to understand these concepts and have a greater control over them, a greater sense of ownership, then we're able uh, to leverage them in order to advance the goals that we want beyond language, you know, in terms of our actions, in terms of working together. So yeah, definitely pattern uh, is, is at the heart of it, um, uh, but it goes far beyond you know, language and involves a wide range of people. One more question, yes. Um, so both, both progressives and conservatives have uh, teams of speechwriters who are, you know, probably both, on both sides, masters of framing arguments, that sort of thing. Yet we talk about the conservatives being really successful at getting these messages out. I was wondering about um, what role do the systems and the infrastructure for spreading these frames or memes or whatever you want to call them out? That, that seems to be one of the core elements of actually being successful at getting your frame into the minds of you know, the populace. Why are the conservatives so much better at that, in your view? It's, it's a good question. I think that there's, there was a, a, a kind of a core level decision that was made in the, in the conservative movement several decades ago that long-term gains for the movement would come through investment, not just in media, but investment in the types of institutions that fostered networks. Um, and so, you know, even before large-scale media ownership, you had this idea uh, that in order uh, to uh, acquire like a long-term conservative uh, authority and rule in this country, in order to push up candidates, you had to grow these institutions 
uh, think tanks and so forth. And so there was a financial investment, but there's also a real belief on, on a level of political theory that unless there were people who were just in charge of fostering those types of connections, um, then there wouldn't be the type of, of, of structure that could support long-term growth uh, for conservatives. And I think that, you know, that coupled in the, in the 1980s with, um, you know, the growth of, of radio personalities and the growth of people who began to, to read, believe it or not, um, uh, theorists from the left, you know, I mean, the, the conservatives began to read Antonio Gramsci, uh, who talks about the political success coming on the backs of being able to control pl uh, cultural discussions, and conservatives realizing that, you know, the way that liberals win elections is because there's a lot of liberals in universities, because there's a lot of liberals in unions, it, that there's a level of politics that goes far beyond institutions and voting and elections that extends into what we would call social and cultural realms. And once you have that insight, um, then you really are way ahead of the pack. And I think that the reason that, that, that liberals in this country lagged behind in that is because they were experiencing kind of the tail of the success uh, of their particular rise uh, to power. And so they did not see it as a moment of investment uh, in the growth of that movement. Thank you all very much. I appreciate your questions. Framing the debate. Jeffrey Feldman is a cultural anthropologist and blogger. He lives in New York City. For more, visit his blog, frameshopisopen.com.